So now we have and now we have some auxiliary equations, right? So when we, we, we have our constitutive models which relate the, the uh, relative permeabilities to saturation. So when we plug those back into our three equations, the relative permeability terms go away. Right? So then it's just a, another function of saturation. Um, we have the capillary pressure effect equations, which relate the pressures. And then we also have the, the, the saturation, you know, this, this sort of a volume fraction ratio. The, the fact that this, this is a the constraint, this is a constraint on the volume fractions, essentially, that they must add up to one. So now, now what's left are the, the only unknowns. The only unknowns are uh, the pressure and the saturation. All right. So I have to admit, you guys probably know more about Brett Buckley Leverett than I do. <laughs> Buckley Leverett is just sort of a, you know, the, those those equations are really complex. By the way, this is just 1D. Right? We haven't even gone to 2 or 3D yet. Th that's, those are the equations for 1D. Right? This coupled, um, I'm going to say nonlinear, but they are linear. Anyway, so, but, you know, very co co complex coupled set of uh, PDEs. And like most PDEs, even simple ones, it's very, very difficult to solve them. Uh, so, what Bu Buckley levered is basically a theory that allows, under a whole bunch of assumptions, for you to get a solution to a 1D problem. And some solutions are always useful for us, even though we know how to compute the numerical solutions, uh, it's always very useful to have analytic solutions so that we can do something called verification. Right? So verification is the process. Verification is what you should have done on your project. Right? You had a known solution. Uh, you could have verified that you coded it. So verify means that we're going to write a code and we want to verify that the code uh, is a correct implementation of the mathematics. We didn't make a coding error. That's a verification, right? So then there's also something called validation. And what validation means is, you know, is it the correct model? So, so verification answers the question basically, did I code the model up correctly? Validation answers the question, is it the correct model for the real physics? Right. So to have something like uh, Buckley Levin is is useful for verification. So everybody who writes a new reservoir simulator for multiphase flow, the first thing they're going to do is solve this problem to make sure that they coded it up correctly. So there are a lot of assumptions. It's only two-phase flow, so oil and water. 1D, we assume everything's incompressible. No capillary pressure, no gravity, no sources or sinks. The core is initially saturated with some SI, some initial saturation <coughs> of the water. Um, at the left-hand side, at x equals 0, uh, there's a constant injection rate, so there's a constant flux in. And at the right-hand side, there's a constant production rate. So at, at the right-hand side, we'll say x equal to L. And this is sort of. Uh, this is what we're after. This is sort of the end result. This is what happens. Um, if, you, if you look at the saturation in a core flood, right, uh, of two-phase flood, of two-phase uh, oil and water, when you, as you come in, you introduce water from the left, uh, you'll get this sort of exponential decay, but there will be a shock, sharp front or a shock front, right? So we typically talk about a, a shock when there's a steep dis, you know, steep discontinuity across an interface, right? So you have this shock front um, that moves along. So this is sort of what we're after. This is the kind of the final answer uh, of what we're after and how we get there is what we're going to go after next. 
right? So if we start with the mass balance equation for water, and we're not going to have any sources or sinks, um, since the rock and the fluids are incompressible, uh, the equation reduces to this. Uh, the form formation volume factors are constant because, again, the fluids are incompressible. Uh, this, uh, then we're going to assume that the velocity, um, is essentially this is just Darcy's law, right? So this is like the, the flow rate of water, the water rate divided by the area, okay? And we haven't introduced, uh, or, you know, the, 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 the flux term is what we're injecting from on the left-hand side, right? That's the input, if you will. But we're going to introduce this um, sort of new, new terminology where Q is the total rate, which is constant. It's the rate coming in, uh, and then there's some fractional flow. So this is the percentage of flow that's the water flowing, okay? Versus, the, you know, it is two-phase. So it's the, the percentage of flow of the water flowing. And since the, uh, the total flow rate is constant, then we can, when we plug this back into our mass balance equation, so we plug this back up here, then we can just pull that out outside the derivative and we get this simplified equation. Pull the Q over A outside. So then we just do the chain rule. Right? So this is that equation. Uh, we're just, since the, the um, fractional flow is a function of saturation, which is a function of the distance along the core, then we'll use the chain rule to get this equation, okay? And then if we look at, if we investigate a, a small change in the water saturation, right, then again using the, the chain rule, or, uh, then, you know, the water saturation, uh, we, get, we get this equation, okay? And what we're looking for is the, sh is the front, right? So we're looking for the front in which the, the change in saturation at, at the front of the constant saturation, there's no change, right? At the front, there's a constant saturation, just one value, right? So that's what we're looking for. So there's no change, okay? So since there's no change, we, this goes to zero, right? And we divide both sides of the equation by dt, okay? And then we solve for dx dt. So if we solve for dx dt, then we get this, right? Solving that equation for dx dt. And dx dt... The first derivative of position, so this is the position of a moving particle, a fluid, right? So the first derivative of the, of the position of a moving particle, a fluid, with respect to time is the velocity, right? That's the definition of it, okay? So we solved for dx dt, which is equal to the velocity, and what we solved for, we, we, we got these equations here, which then using, using the, this guy, we can re reduce to this equation here. So ultimately, the velocity of a constant saturation front is equal to this, is proportional to the derivative of the fractional flow curve, okay? And then we introduce some dimensional variables. So we take xd to be the position of x divided by the total length and we take TD to be the, the percentage or the, the amount of poor, volu poor volumes injected. Uh, so um, the amount of poor volume injected is Q, the input, times time, right? Uh, and then we divide it by the poor volume of the core, and that gives us a dimensionless time, okay? You, you can work through the details, but <coughs> the dimensions of that are dimensionless, okay? And so then we just... From the equation we just derived on the on the previous, it says that you know the velocity essentially the velocity uh, is proportional to the derivative of the fractional flow curve with respect to saturation. Uh, then we just introduce into that equation these dimensionless variables. Okay, so x becomes x d, t becomes t d. Uh, 
right? This equation then we can integrate with respect to time, and we get this, right? And so, what is the fractional flow, right? So the fractional flow is the, the fractional flow of, of water. It's the total flow of water divided by the total flow, which is the flow of oil and water, okay? And then we just substitute Darcy's law into that. So we just substitute Darcy's law into that, right? And I know it looks like a lot of terms disappeared, but remember we had... For like the total, for the flow rate of water, we'd have K, K, R, W, right? But, and for the flow of oil, we'd have K, K, R, O, right? But the Ks are the same, so they ended up, they end up canceling. All the, 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 um, the, the pressure differential ends up canceling. It's the same everywhere. So all those terms end up canceling, right? And so, uh, so then, using our, Constitutive relations, right? The things we measure in the in the lab, we just plug them into that equation up there, and we get a function of fractional, you know, the fractional flow is a function of water saturation. So this blue line, that's not what we want. We want the derivative of that, right? Well, the derivative of that is just at any point. The derivative at any point is just the tangent line to the curve, right? So that's what we're after. It's this thing. Okay, so just to rehash how you get the saturation profile, um, you choose the dimensionless time, you create the fractional flow curve from the relative permeability data. Um, then you, you could compute this, this derivative uh, numerically, right? If you have a curve, then you can interpolate that curve into a function, and then you can take the derivative of that function. That's uh, just as a little aside. When you take, when you do numerical differentiation, so if you have data, you have real data, and you, if you were to just try to finite difference it, right? So it, it's one thing when we finite difference a PDE, which is initially smooth, but real data can be noisy. It right? can have little variations in it. And if you just try to finite difference it. The, it's going to give you really noisy derivative data. It's going to be really bad. Right? So it's, it's always good to, don't just try to, when you're trying to take a derivative of data, right? Because that's essentially what you're doing here. You have relative permeability data. You use that data to make a uh, fractional flow versus saturation curve. It's going to be j noisy. There's going to be some little jumps in it because it comes from real data. And, and with that, then, uh, you know, when you try to take a derivative of it, don't do finite differencing. Uh, what you need to do first is interpolate a curve. So, like, do some polynomial interpolation, right? fit a curve to it, and then differentiate the curve. Right? So that, which, you know, hopefully your data is sort of smooth because it's sort of really hard to fit polynomials to stuff that wildly awesome, you know, goes crazy. But anyway, um, okay. So generate the curve, compute the derivative numerically by interpolating first. Um, and then with that, you have a function that relates that, uh, that derivative you compute uh, times time gives you your position, right? So then that, that allows you to make the water saturation curve as a function of position along the axis, okay? So you would, you would con you'd, you'd do this for every possible water saturation. Between the water saturation, uh, the initial water saturation and the water saturation of oil, or one minus that. And with that, then that's what gives you that's what gives you the profile. So, so you see the profile? That's, that procedure we just discussed is what's going to give you that slope profile, okay? 
And in fact, it'll give you that whole curve, but something's wrong. Something's not physically right. Because this, you know, we saw that, and we see an experiment that the front is actually sharp. It's a shock. And so if you were to just cut that thing off, you know, at any, at any position XD, you could have two possi possible saturations, right? You could have the one, the lower one or the upper one. Which one is correct, right? And, or, the, or another way to say it is that's not physically possible. You, there's only one saturation. If you're flowing water into a water and oil saturated coil, uh, core and you're looking for the saturation of water, it's only going to have one value. Right? So something's not right. Or we need to do something to correct it. So we'll skip that. Yeah, so essentially, the initial, the, the initial um, we're going to use our conservation of mass equation again, but we're going to write it right at the shock front. So mass has to be conserved even across a shock. This is something that we don't use, but so-called ranking Hugonia jump condition. So all conservation equations apply even at the front of a shock, okay? So essentially, we're going to write we're going to write the mass balance across the front of the shock, and that's this equation. But then some algebra leads to this relationship. <coughs> okay, and so the, with that, with that, we we sort of have. Uh, two equations des describing the velocity of the shock front. And th they suggest, that, you know, if we sort of take this in the limit, as these terms go to zero, then, then that equals that, which equals that. So we can plug that back in over there. And it sort of gives us that, that what's on the right is sort of the secant line that aligns with the tangent to the curve at the front. And so pictorially, that's some, something like that. So, so we have the, you know, numerically we can we can differentiate, and then when the two curves align, as suggested by this equation, right? Then that gives us the actual saturation of water at the shock front. Okay, so it, it's basically. We're going to draw a secant line from the initial water saturation, which would be like 20% in this equation, to where this inflection point is. So we're going to draw that secant line. Right. And then this is sort of the, so we can, we can compute the saturation of the waterfront uh, the saturation of water at the front by using this secant method, okay? And then we'll do what we did before to generate the profile up till up till the saturation of the water front, and then we cut it off. And that's what gives us the final curve, right? So at the so this initial slow part of the curve, we just do what we did before. It's just when we get to this point, we don't draw the rest of the profile. Okay? So we just cut it off at the saturation of the waterfront, which we can get from that secant method. So again, that, that should, you probably spent three weeks on that in Res 2, right? So it's probably much more thorough than <laughs> what I just went through. And uh, that's actually where we'll stop today. <laughs>